What's going on, everybody? Welcome to this week's Lumix Live. Uh, we are back and uh, pretty close back to full uh, full bandwidth uh, from last week's uh, stream. Uh, so yeah, uh, today uh, the purpose of today is to talk about the Lumix DFD autofocusing system and to take questions from all of you in the chat. Um, this isn't going to be a massive deep dive down into the autofocusing system. Um, that will be its own or w would take its own series of sessions to cover. But um, I want to go through some of the questions actually that people have already been asking about the autofocusing system. Um, I want to show you all how I use it uh, for different scenarios. We've talked about it within conversations through other streams, uh, but I kind of felt after following a lot of conversations that a number of you have had over on Reddit and Facebook and Instagram and places like that, that a, a singular stream just about it's probably due at this point. Uh, so yeah, we're going to be covering a lot of this stuff. If you have questions throughout the stream, make sure to ask them in the chat uh, and we'll do our best to cover um, pretty much everything that we can. Um, Let's see here. If you are new to these uh, live streams, these are weekly broadcasts that we do where we just talk about the technology, we take questions from all of you, and you get to have answers right from a source instead of third third hand information from someone online who may or may not know you know everything about the products. Um, this is this is the platform where if you've got a question, you can ask us, and we're going to get you the best answer that we possibly can uh, for it. So um, yeah. Uh, before we dive too deep into this, I want to remind everybody about Lumix Pro Services. In the United States, we have Red and Platinum tier. I've talked about this every single week for the last almost two years. Uh, the Red is free if you own a Lumix camera. Um, make sure to get yourself registered, at least on the free program. Um, you get yourself uh, registered here in the United States through the QR code on the screen or through going to lumix-pro.us uh, and having a qualified camera purchased from an authorized dealer. Uh, if you're not joining in the U.S., you can take a look down in the description. We have uh, links to the global portal, which will let you um, uh, go to the Lumix Pro Services platform that's available for your country. Uh, so be sure to check it out. Um, like I said, red is free. Platinum is if you want to get the extra level of service uh, with your equipment. Uh, that's where you get things like free next day shipping uh, and two-day repair turnaround times. 20% off out of warranty repairs if you drop or break a camera, things like that. You get the membership hotline where you can um, actually call in and message if you need um, uh, more in-depth support that you really don't want to deal with over a chat. Uh, and yeah, it's it's a really solid platform to get you set up in case something happens to your equipment or you just want to have your equipment serviced between seasons. So let's uh let's start by just taking a quick look at some of the questions that we've had uh submitted here from the beginning uh so um let's see here william says uh did panasonic provide the additional dfd improvements in the gh6 via software might we possibly receive future firmware updates for s series uh specifically the s5 to bring similar improvements and then a follow-up was i know the gh6 received a new processor was just hoping that it would come back to the older cameras uh well so the vast majority of the updates that came in the GH6 are hand in hand with a new sensor that reads out much faster than the existing sensors, uh, as well as the new processors. So, of course, uh, refined algorithms and refined updates will will come. Um, you know, those are the kinds of things that we're always working on to improve in previous generation cameras. Uh, but with the GH6, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a different animal because that camera is a totally new platform ground up. Um, that allows the system to work faster. It's also a much newer processor, totally new revision. So certain things may not be able to get brought back. Some things might be able to. Um, we don't have a definitive on those kinds of things yet uh, since we haven't really released any firmware update for anything outside of the GH6 recently. Uh, so... At that point, I'd kind of say just keep your ear to the ground. Um, if there are updates that can be added, you know, we're, we're pretty good with adding firmware updates, uh, especially improvements as we kind of uh, evolve the systems moving forward. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's no guarantee that everything can come back to the older cameras. It is a totally different uh, sensor and architecture. So uh, let's see here. Next question was Dave's Nature says, are focus peaking settings available on manual video mode in the GH6? 
I've only been able to adjust uh, focus peaking uh, if I switch to a photo mode and then adjust back. Um, yes, absolutely. The um, focus peaking settings can be adjusted in the video mode. So uh, if we jump over here, I've got my GH6 attached uh, up so I can go through some of the menus, show you where. Uh, so to start with, if I just go right into the camera menu, uh, go to the focus option under the main uh, camera uh, screen here. So if I turn display on, you'll see under the video menu. Uh, and then if I go to focus, you'll see when I scroll down, I've got focus peaking. I can go to set and then this is where I can tweak um, the sensitivity of the focus peaking, change the colors, uh, program how it works uh, when you're using either AFS or when you're in manual focus, adjust what, which parts of manual focus will uh, enable and disable and show uh, your focus peaking. So it is 100% doable. Um, you just have to go to the uh, focus menu while you're in the video mode. Um, so let's see here. Uh, Martin says, what would really take DFD to the next level is if there would be a numerical representation on screen indicating current lens position. Uh, there's manual focusing scale, uh, but that's in manual. Um, save three focus points between them. We want to be able to examine the scene. So it could be cool. I think it's a, it's a fairly complicated way of, of adjusting and kind of representing where the focus point is. Um, from what I can gather, what you're describing though, a lot of people get around this where if you want to be able to have the camera find a focus point and then be able to go to manual focus to refine it, most of the people that I've been working with at that point are just switching into manual focus using the rear AF button or uh, however you have the camera set up to get the camera to go to that point and then manually focus and tweak it if you want to do some slight adjustments. Um, to do it the other way where you have autofocus and then uh, you have manual override, you can do something similar to this, uh, but there isn't the... Uh, uh, kind of numerical information being provided. So if you are in autofocus, you would do something along the lines of, I think it's under the lens control. Um, under the lens control, you would do lens focus resume. Maybe it's not actually, maybe that might've been one of the older cameras. Um, I'll have to dig a little bit further into that, but there there was a way that you can set the camera up in autofocus that uh, you have manual focus override um, while you're actually using the system. So if I come in here and go into, oh yeah, here it is, AF and MF. So if I go into the uh, settings menu in the camera, go into the autofocus menu, and this will be found on a number of the cameras. Uh, when you go to AF and MF, uh, what that will be is that if I have the camera set here to on, and I use my manual focus, while I'm, while I'm half pressing, I still have the ability to come in and adjust my manual focus with it. Uh, so it does give you a little bit of an override if you're in autofocus, um, but you would be in autofocus single for that. Uh, let's see here. Powell asks, uh, is it possible to add 5.7K in, well, let me change my camera angle. Um, is it possible to add 5.7K in 16 by 9 at least at 25 and 30p to the GH6, 50 or 60p when recording to an SSD uh, and when recording into an SSD will be available? Uh, so the first part of the question, um, the bigger thing I'd ask is, do you find you're having a problem with 17 by 9 versus 16 by 9? Yes, there's a little bit of a crop on the width side of it, but... Uh, 5.7K at 25 and 30p are already in the camera. They are 17 by 9 aspect ratios. If there's a specific reason why you need 16 by 9, um, you know, I can kind of bring that up to the team and see if there's a way to do 16 by 9 in those ratios. It wouldn't necessarily be 5.7K because 5.7K is the full width of the sensor. Um, so you'd have to do some creative downsampling to do a 16 by 9. Um, but, uh, it, it's something we can ask. So if, if you can respond down in the chat, um, you know, what the kind of use cases are basically just kind of build a case for adding 16 by nine and 5.7 K or a similar ish resolution, since there would be a slight difference there. Um, I can present it up to the team and see if it's something that's, that's doable or something that, uh, is relatively easy to, to work on. Uh, now for the second part of the question was, uh, recording to SSD, when's that going to be available? 
Um, it should be available soon. Uh, with the firmware updates, we felt that since the rest of the system, the rest of the update that we had talked about originally uh, was pretty much ready, uh, we would release this first, make sure that we've got um, those features coming. External SSD is a bit of new territory for DSLMs outside of a handful of, you know, kind of what are considered more cinema-oriented cameras. Uh, so when it comes to us releasing and updating something like this, one of the biggest things that if you've been following the Lumix brand for a long time is about quality and reliability. So if we add a feature, it needs to work properly. When you start working with uh, non-Lumix controlled products, so media, so memory cards, um, stuff like that, it takes a bit more due diligence to make sure that when we release something like this, we're one going to be able to tell you like, Hey, these are the things that we've tested it with that it works fine. Um, and two that, you know, it's going to be a, a, a seamless experience when you start using some of those devices. Um, something that a lot of people may not realize is that SSDs across the board have different power draw levels. Um, this is one of the things that, I mean, if you've been following, uh, SSD replacements in the PC world or in the handheld gaming world, uh, I believe it's the Steam Deck is one of the things where they've said, even though it's a standardized, you know, uh, NVMe SSD, some devices may draw more power, which can cause issues, EMI, stuff like that. When it comes to those devices with cameras, um, it could just be down to power draw. So uh, as we get closer to when we're ready to release that and have a list of uh, you know, kind of tested external SSDs will definitely be letting everybody know and you'll definitely hear about it and see uh, what can be done uh, on this stream here. So uh, what would be interesting is if you drop down in the chat, if you are using a camera that supports external SSD recording already, or if it's something that you're looking into, um, do you have preferred brands? Are there uh, specific types of external SSDs that, that you prefer to use? Um, like as an example, I know things like this, the Samsung T5 drives are some of the most popular uh, in the market because they're small, they're one terabyte, um, it's USB-C, and you know, the connectivity is pretty solid there. So um, that kind of stuff. If you, if you have preferred uh, options, drop them in the chat. That kind of stuff always helps uh, our teams you know, focus on you know, what are the most popular ones to be testing because we always know what we want to make sure we're testing with and what we understand, but hearing it from your mouths is... Uh, uh, definitely incredibly valuable. So let's see here. Uh, Randall says, best focus settings for bird photography, particularly bird in flight. Uh, yeah, so this one's going to be up to a bit of interpretation. Uh, so uh, as one who is not necessarily a big um, bird in flight photographer, uh, there's a couple things that, with the Lumix cameras, I will typically set my camera up for um, to kind of increase my chances uh, of doing it. So one of the first things that I typically suggest everyone do if you're looking at how to get your camera set up for um, bird in flight is go into the camera menu. It's going to be under the photo settings if we're talking about photography, since the question's about photography. And then you're going to go down into the focus menu. Now, depending on whichever camera you're using, in this case, I have my GH6 hooked up here, so there's a couple differences in the menus. Uh, notably, the AF detection settings are decoupled from some of the rest of the menus, so it's a little bit more fine-tuned control, but the principles will be the same. So for this, uh, typically turn the uh, AF detection settings on, so in that case would be, uh, for most of our cameras, it's going to be animal and human. So when you have that on, that's kind of like one of the first things to set up. The other kind of thing to maybe take a look at is the different uh, AF custom settings that are built into the camera. Uh, each of these modes will have different tuning uh, for how the system's going to stick to a subject, uh, how it's going to handle uh, ignoring uh, foreground, background, things like that. So... If you'll notice in all the cameras, there's typically going to be four different options available. Set one, two, three, and four. Um, in the GH6, if you're someone using that camera, we have uh, kind of what I would say is more uh, in-depth descriptions for each of these modes. 
So things like your AF sensitivity, motion, uh, moving uh, uh, subject prediction, and the speed are all slightly tweaked between these things. And if you start looking uh, through the four modes that we have in the camera, the, they're going to be default at set one, which is going to be a relatively baseline uh, option. So bird and flight, I typically tend to look at at least the way our uh, camera descriptions go is closest to things like football, basketball as to what we have listed in the camera. Now, I know some photographers and so, some of you out there may freak out because I say bird and flight is like sports shooting. But in reality, if we break down what the challenges are of the type of shooting, they are fairly similar. If you're capturing birds in flight and you've got, say, a busy background or you've got multiple other objects in the frame, you want it to try to stick as close as you can to the subject that you're selecting and try to ignore the background. Well, that's kind of the same as football or basketball, things like that. You have your subject distracting environment around it. You want to have it try to ignore as much of the outer area as you can. So to start with, I typically would suggest trying things like set three on the GH6, which would be a negative one in sensitivity, plus one in switching speed, and plus two in motion prediction. Um, this should help uh, from a speed, uh, since, uh, speed method. Um, again, this is not going to be perfect for every single situation. There may be some situations where you actually want to increase the speed because you prefer that particular look. But this can be a good baseline to start with. Um, the other major thing that typically gets overlooked uh, is actually when you go into the different options that you have as the base for your um, detection modes. Earlier Lumix cameras like the G9, uh, typically bird and flight or uh, the detection modes are tied to the 225 area. So what that means is that when you lose the subject, it reverts to the full, full frame area of focus. And in a case like that, if you're against an ex extremely contrasty background, um, that's where you may run into a situation where it's going to see that contrast because it doesn't have a detection point and it's going to go to that point because that's what the full area focusing is designed to do. It's supposed to look at, you know, the entire frame, and then it picks the focus point for you. You're not giving it any kind of input as to what it is you want to focus on. Um, and cameras these days are, I mean, they're just computers. Input, output, the best information you can put into it, the better the output is you're going to get from it. So if your camera has the ability to go in and select things like one area or one area plus, while also using the detection modes, that is going to massively increase your keeper rate and the stickiness of how that system works. The reason for this is that if for some reason you lose the detection box around a bird in flight or a person, uh, I'll go back to the basketball analogy. If you lose the subject detection box on the particular subject that you're focusing on, the system doesn't revert back to the 225, which will just focus on the first thing that it can. This will tell the camera, yes, I know you don't have a subject, but f this box is the fallback priority. So make sure you stay on that. Um, another good alternative would be to use the, um, the zone focusing in the camera if you have that. Even if you don't want to use the detection modes, the zone area AF is going to be a really good option as well. Because again, you're isolating down the area that the camera is going to look at for focus information. Uh, using that full area is great for casual shooting, but if you know you want much more in-depth and you're really trying to isolate out, these are the different modes that can really help. Um, again, the cameras that can bulk up the regular uh, focus point modes with animal detection and face and eye and human detection, anytime you can go in and give it that, that solid fallback is where you're going to have the better results. Um, so if I remember right, I think that's primarily on the GH6. Um, if I look at my S5 here, I think my S5, well, how far is in autofocus? Uh, my S5 also allows me to add it to one area and one area plus. And I know the rest of the S series cameras do that as well because it was a an, an addition that came over firmware. 
Uh, and I believe the GH5 Mark II can do this as well. You can't do it to the zone area, but at least one area plus and one area. One area plus, you get the middle box. Um, if I go into it here, I'll show you. Uh, one area plus, you get that middle box here that you can see. And then as I change the size of it, you have the two boxes there. You have the inner box and then the outer box. The inner box is primary. The outer box is the secondary points that it's going to look at. So there's a number of options that you'll, you'll have available to kind of help isolate down how the focusing system works. So hopefully that was a helpful answer for you, Randall. Uh, let's see here. Ulrich picked up a 9mm. Awesome. Can't wait to see the images that you take with it. Uh, how's it going? Let's see here. Peter, welcome back. Uh, thanks for, uh, thanks for uh, joining the stream again. Uh, let's see here. Jeremy says, I registered my GH6 the day I received it pre-ordered and haven't seen any India any indication of the free CF Express card. Should I have gotten an email or something? Uh, if you can confirm that you're in the US, Jeremy, um, I can only speak for the US side of the uh, CF Express card uh, program. Um, but yeah, if you if you can confirm one that you're in the US and then if need be, shoot me an email at the Lumix live at us.panasonic.com and I can forward that over to the uh, LPS team just to confirm. There may be a little bit of a backlog because of shipping, um, but you should have received something. Um, so I can, I can dig into it a little bit more and see. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see here. 17 by 9 seems to be cropped horizontally compared to 16 by 9 and not the other way around. Less pixels. I need more horizontal angle of view because I delivered 16 by 9 100% of the time anyway. Okay, so um, I can definitely bring it up um, to to our team uh, about that. Uh, the 5 point... So 5.7K and 16 by 9 shouldn't be changing any horizontal crop. But I will have to look a little bit more into that. Um, if anything, 17 by 9, you're going to have a slightly shorter and wider image versus 16 by 9, which will be shorter and taller. Um, but I will have to look into it. Resolution-wise, I mean, you're getting the same resolution. Field of view shouldn't change too much, but I will have to just double check. Um, let's see here. Jeremy votes for Samsung drives, uh, Samsung's 99% probability, long concerts, and ProRes 5.7K so I don't kill my PC during editing. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, is it possible to design an autofocus system or DFD to move the lens uh, to hyperfocal distance based on focal length and aperture? Uh, possibly. Um, I mean, that's definitely an interesting idea. Um, for those that don't know uh, about hyperfocal distances, um, it's basically like the, the simplest way I can describe it. It's the point where you can focus your lens and at a given aperture, you're going to be, everything's in focus. Um, works really nice on ultra wide angle lenses and street photography, stuff like that, where you know you can set it at a certain distance and you know you've got enough depth of field. Um, it's, it's probably possible. It's something I'd have to uh, bring up to the engineers though. Let's see here. Uh, same question about tips for bird and flight, but in video, almost always in 50 or 100p. So far, I struggle to acquire focus most of the time. Um, so when it comes to video, there's going to be a, probably a little bit of a difference there. Uh, so in the photography modes, the focusing system works it can work much, much faster. Um, and that's going to be relatively the same for, I think, almost any, uh, any camera out there. Um, because you're not bound by uh, kind of the motion smoothness of different frame rates, you may run into some situations where obviously higher frame rate can provide better, faster focusing. Slower frame rate um, typically is going to be a little bit less lagged um, uh, or a little more lagged. But ultimately, when it comes to shooting in video, uh, if you're going to be doing any kind of autofocus, this is where tweaking some of the settings also for the... Uh, video side of the camera. So if I change this back into video uh, and I go into my different focus modes here, uh, this is where um, coming in, I'll help if I change it into the right mode. Uh, this is where coming in, going into the AF custom settings and adjusting some of your speed and sensitivity probably can help you. Um, 
there's always going to be a point where you want to watch how hard you push things like speed um, because speed on our system is going to mean how fast it's going to be trying to move between detection points. Um, if you're doing something like an interview style like I do here, it's a fairly simple setup. You know, obviously you want to minimize how much the camera moves. You also want to kind of isolate out how often the camera is going to be looking for new focus. Uh, or in a lot of cases, you're just going to be switching into manual focus because your depth of field is going to be enough to cover someone doing this. But burden flight, because it's ultra unpredictable, that's where there there can be some challenges with, with using, using the different types of modes. Um, the best tips I can give, uh, make sure you're using either one area or one area plus or the um, zone area to isolate down the region. Um, typically, I would suggest when you are about to start filming, use either a back button focus to override and uh, force the camera to the point that you're trying to go to. And then when you let go, you'll see that it'll stick to that point. Um, depending on how fast the birds are moving, that could be a different challenge. Uh, so there's a lot of variables, but if you're always shooting in 50 or hundred frames per second, um, you know, obviously make sure you're keeping, uh, about 180 degree shutter angle. So double your frame rate. So if you're at hundred frames per second, make sure you're shooting at least uh, two hundredth of a second shutter speed. Uh, and then you have to judge how much motion blur you want in, in the frame. Um, some of that could be down to more artistic choice. Others can be down to, you know, just how much do you really need to get the, the footage done. Higher frame rate, typically, uh, typically is shot at a faster shutter speed if you're looking for sharpness. Um, so if you're going to be doing a slow-mo or you want to be using it to kind of like analyze an image, that's where you're going to shoot high frame rate, but like a 90 degree shutter angle. You want something really fast and staccato. Um, the more you slow that shutter speed down, the more the frames are going to blur. Uh, so just kind of play around with those. Um, but again, to, to get to that first acquisition of a point, typically I suggest if you're going to be uh, setting the camera up and say the zone focusing, use the back button AF, get it to the point first, and then you know even while you're in continuous autofocus, that'll still work. Um, it'll get to the point and then you can let con uh, continuous take over, but you'll probably want to play around with some of the AF custom settings a little bit. Um, we have the AF custom settings guidebook uh, available online. Uh, I forgot to pull it up at the beginning of this, so let me pull that up. Uh, because that was also updated for video usage. So I'm going to drop this down in the chat here. So uh, the link that I just dropped down in the chat, uh, that is the most up-to-date AF guidebook. Um, and it now does have some video-oriented uh, updates as well. So take a look at those, play around with some of the settings. Um, and yeah. Uh, let's see here. William, does the Elmat Alliance share software specifications to allow DFD to work with Sigma lenses, for example, or Panasonic lenses only guarantee for DFD results? Um, unfortunately, that's an answer that I cannot uh, provide uh, right now. Um yeah, that's about as much as I can say about it. Uh, it's it's a bit over what I know, um, so I really can't provide much detail there. Uh, let's see here. Somewhat related, on the G90 and the G100, is there a way to choose which face to focus on in face detection? I tried touching people's faces, but it doesn't work. Um, I will have to get my G100 out and uh, do a little checking. There is a way to do it. I just off the top of my head, I cannot remember exactly how when you're in face detect uh, or body detection there is a way to toggle between them on that camera um so give me a little bit of time um i'll get the camera out charged up and then uh, i i'll be able to look into that for you and if it's if it's on the g9 it should be the same on the the g90 as well or g95 for those in the region that that camera is called that uh let's see here uh can you enable a function to increase zone in af a bit more than it is possible now um, what do you mean increase the zone in AF? Uh, if you can give me a little more detail, I might be able to uh, address. Are you talking about the size of the boxes or the size of the zone area? Um, let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll dig into a little bit more of an answer there for you. Uh, let's see here. 
Uh, DJ Electric, got the new Sigma 1628-218. Very curious how cooperative DFD will be with it. Um, I like the full handshake native communication has. So, yeah, in a case like that, I unfortunately don't have information um, for you as far as whether or not those lenses have DFD uh, or that information uh, shared there. Um, I can look into it, uh, but, yeah, it's an answer I unfortunately don't have for you. Uh, let's see here. Great things. Can we get the Cine file naming from the BS1... Cine file naming in the BS1 H and BGH1? Um, it is something that I've definitely asked uh, about. Um, knowing that the Cine file naming is is the first thing that we've released on the... The, the first camera that has it is the GH6. Um, I can ask and push. Um, I partially agree that having the cine file naming makes a little more sense on the box cameras um i mean it makes total sense on a gh6 since it's you know a production ready camera um but yeah the, the box cameras would make sense so uh you definitely have my support uh that i'll you know to push on things like that let's see here uh amit says uh, when outputting the camera info over HDMI, the info displays on the GH6 LCD, even though the information is displayed on, uh, and I can see the info on the external monitor of the camera LCD says info less. Yes, this is something that I know, um, some users have asked. In fact, I have my GH6 hooked up right now for this. Um, I did ask the question. I just have, uh, honestly, I just have not had time to follow up on it. Um, so I will follow up on that question, uh, for everybody and, uh, try to get you an answer sometime by next week. Uh, let's see here. In bird photography, why don't you use the tracking mode? Or why shouldn't you use the tracking mode? Or why am I not recommending to use the tracking mode? I think it would be a better way. Um, so, I, honestly, I, this is really where I'd say it's, it's down more to how you've brought yourself up in, in the industry. Um... The, the opinions that I give you are based a lot more on someone who has started in photography back in film cameras where your center point is what you focused with, and then you'd recompose. Um, so it, in a lot of cases, that's usually where the base of my recommendations come from. Um, yes, tracking modes are awesome and they can be great. Um, because they, they can take a lot of the challenge out of what you're trying to shoot. Uh, typically the reason why I don't recommend, uh, the, the actual like tracking mode that you can see on the screen here, usually I don't recommend it really just because I've never been comfortable with using it. I've never been someone who's been able to really have tracking AF systems work great. And I don't care which one you throw at me. I've never been able to get them to work the way I want them to. Um, so the vast majority of the time, I typically take the stance that with an autofocusing system from any manufacturer, they're only as smart as what you are providing them or the directions that you give them. So yes, we have a lot of these assist features now. So animal detection, face detection, eye detection, all those different modes. Um, and those are great, but with tracking AF, when the tracking AF is lost, it reverts to 225. That is where my personal point is, is that I always want to have it where if something were to block the tracking mode, uh, or the tracking mode, you're photographing, say, a bunch of birds together and they all look relatively similar, and two of them cross paths with each other, and then the tracking now goes on to that other other bird. Um, I want the camera to be able to fall back when it doesn't have that and go to the point that I'm telling it to go to. So that's typically why I'll, I'll use either the zone area or one area and one area plus. Um, that's not to say that using tracking is a bad thing. If it works for you, that's awesome. Um, in a camera like the GH6, as you can see here, I have the ability to put animal and human and eye detection and all these different modes on with the tracking mode as well. So that definitely can help. Uh, but truthfully, bird and flight and um, any kind of uh, photography of animals like that is not my uh, strong suit. So 
you could take some of my recommendations with a grain of salt because there are a lot of other users out there that are way more versed in these things and uh, may have better ways that they're working with it. Um, I don't want to ever come across as someone who knows everything about these. Um, but in my experience is testing our cameras and not even just our cameras, testing cameras in general. Because uh, before I worked for Panasonic, I was in photo retail. So I got to play with everything. Um, I just always found that typically I would always revert to a one area or a group over any tracking mode that was available on the camera. I just felt that I was more confidently able to get a result that I wanted out of it than letting the camera make a decision for me that I don't know how it's making that decision. Um, so yeah, hopefully that kind of answers that uh, a little bit. Uh, Steve Clark says, uh, same issue with the CF Express card, visited Lumix Pro site, so GX, but it didn't take the kit lens, uh, re-registered and got uh, the card three days later. Okay, so... Yeah, so for uh, Jeremy, um, shoot an email to the Lumix Live email address. Um, I will check in with that team. It's possible that uh, it, it, there might just be something hanging. Uh, if you go into your Lumix Pro account and just double check, um, uh, just double check and make sure the camera's registered there, um, that makes things a lot easier. But if you email me uh, through the Lumix Live account, uh, I can make sure that if you have to re-register it since we're past the deadline, um, that, you know, if it was registered and everything's there and you've got, you know, the emails with it, that we can make sure that that gets, uh, sorted out for you. Uh, let's see here. Uh, is there any way, uh, some of us could join the beta test community to help you guys get that seamless experience? Uh, we accept all the risks of what comes. Um, so as far as like a beta test community, there really isn't that big of a beta test community um, as far as like, you know, we look at public. Um, that's usually not something that's commonly done. Uh, what we do, you know, myself, a lot of our ambassadors, our engineers, uh, and then select reviewers, things like that, obviously can get access to some things earlier. Um, if you're ever interested in that kind of stuff, you can always reach out to us. And if something happens to come up, Maybe we can consider it and uh, and go, you know, kind of down that path. But there are no guarantees of, of that kind of program expanding um, to every single person out there. Otherwise, every single person is going to ask and they want to be part of beta testing, stuff like that. Um, but, yeah, so that's that's something. Reach out to us. Um, you know, give us an idea of what it is you want to do. And, and if something matches, cool, something matches. But... More likely than not, there may not be that much of a match, um, depending. But, you know, so I, I, I just don't want to get anyone's hopes up by saying, like, yeah, sure, submit, um, you know, because you want to beta test stuff. Um, you know, you want to you wanna be able to, to do some of this stuff, but we also want to make sure that we're just level setting and making, not setting someone's expectations way too high when it comes to stuff like that. Oh, Okay. Um, let's see here. Okay. Size of the zone. Okay. So that is uh, a great point. So with the cameras that you're working on, um, the S series cameras and the G series cameras, each one will have a slightly different way to do this. Um, but for the vast majority of the cameras, um, if you want to change the size of the zone or the focus point that you're working in on cameras like the GH6, which is what I'll show first, um, we've made a little bit of a change as to, and it'll help if I had the camera up. We've made a change as to how the zone area looks on this camera. Uh, every camera prior to this, it's a field of boxes in usually like a diamond or a line or a customized, uh, option mode there. Um, so I'm going to show you on the GH6. Uh, I might be able to show it on my box camera. I can't remember if the box camera has zone AF, but I can check cause I've got it hooked up. So the first thing you do is use the back button to actually get into the AF uh, selection modes. So the screen that you see on, on camera now. And then for here, I'm just going to drop the arrow down. Uh, so in that case, I just pulled the joystick down. And then I rotate my rear dial. And this is what lets me come in and change the size of the box. Now on the GH6, like I said, this is a different user interface um, than the previous cameras. So it's more brackets instead of the boxes, but the principle's the same. So you have that option there. 
on cameras like the, um, which actually I just realized I don't even have zone focus turned on on my uh, S5. Uh, so on my S5, uh, if I go into my AF settings and then I have to show the zone modes. Uh, actually, I can do it on this one because I'll, sh I'll show you where those zone modes are. So uh, on a lot of the newer cameras, you have the ability to show and hide different AF modes. So ones that you really like. Um, some of the ones, if you, some of the, uh, modes you may really always want to use some of the, uh, cameras, you just may not really want to use some of those modes. So being able to turn them on and off just makes the user interface a lot cleaner. Um, so let's see here. So if we go into show and hide modes, uh, you can see, you can come in here and turn on and off the different modes that you want. Uh, right now, since I'm on the GH6 here, you'll see I have zone, zone horizontal and vertical, uh, and then full area. So if I come in here and go into zone here, go into this, you'll see that I can change uh, some of these modes a bit. So that's the horizontal one. Uh, if I hold the camera vertical, that's my vertical one. Uh, so there's a couple ways you can change those. Um, standard focus modes, the same thing. You just pull down and then rotate the rear dial. And then this is how I can change the size of my focus boxes, uh, depending on the modes that I'm recording in, uh, on the S five and a number of the other ones, you'll also see that you'll have zone vertical and horizontal, which is the line. You'll also have square oval. And then you'll also have a couple custom options that you can plug in. Uh, not all the cameras are going to have a, the option to go in and make a custom zone. So if you want to change some of the sizes, that's where you would be able to go in. Um, you'd be able to, to go in to custom on some of the cameras, select a point and then shift it there. Uh, I meant that the zone is too small at its maximum size. Uh, I know how to adjust the range adjustment seems too small. I would like to ignore edges of the frame only, uh, which camera are you using? Um, uh, for your setup. It's possible that it may be there. You may just have to create a custom one. Um, cause a lot of the cameras like the GH six, it's designed so that it keeps it in, in like the, the proper area. And then you're going to move it around because, okay. So on the GH six, so on the GH six, um, if you want to go, let's see here. Uh, well on the GH six, as far as the zone goes, you're pretty much about, that's about as, as much as you're going to have on it, uh, for the zone area. So the only other thing would be at that point is to go to the full frame. Um, because if you only want it to kind of block out some of the edges, it, it's going to effectively work about the same as the 225 area or in the GH6's case, cause it's got more than 225 points it's going to be kind of right about in that area. So that might be why, but it is something I can ask our, our team is to, is there a reason why it doesn't go any bigger? Um, and then see, um, I don't ever want to say no, it's not possible. Um, but as of right now, that's kind of how you would basically set it up. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, Lumix tracking good for targeting the head of a bird and such, re uh, then re wow. Uh, Lumix tracking good for targeting the head on a bird or such then recomposing. Y yeah. So I think w one of the points I was, I, I would want to make is that when I say about not using tracking, it's not necessarily to say that it's that I don't see the value of it. Um, the animal detection does prioritize the front half of the animal. So it does prioritize the head. Um, obviously motion is going to cause some of those challenges to whether or not when you take the picture, it is that, at that point in the, the box of the area. Um, so yeah, there's a little bit of a challenge there, but again, it's why I typically would, would suggest going into one area or one area plus and setting where you want your framing to be so that you're now just moving the camera since we don't have to focus and recompose anymore. I can come in here with my one area uh, I can come in here with my one area and say like, all right, I always want to make sure that, you know, framing wise, I've got it up in this corner here. That's where I want my frame to be. And just know that I'm following and keeping that point right there. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's see here. 
Mars desk. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I'm sorry you feel that way. Um, this is definitely a, a stream of wanting everyone to be able to ask us questions and provide answers. So, uh, let's hear. Steven says, SanDisk Extreme SSD support would be amazing because they're really small and rugged drives. Um, okay, yeah, we, we can add that into the uh, add that into the list to see if that's something. Um, again, just remember power delivery on different SSDs that does come into consideration. I would have to have the engineers take a look and see if if those drives draw more power and depending. Um, but yeah, we can uh, always recommend it and bring it up to the team. Uh, let's see here. Can the EVA handle, uh, work with the BS1H or S1H? Uh, will the LANC, uh, signal carry? If so, confirm or allow this. Um, I know that this got asked, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I know that I got the question at, I think it was Infocom. Um, I had gotten the question about that handle. Um, I don't have one, so I haven't been able to check it. Uh, so we'll definitely have to see if I can get uh, a hold of one of them. If it's a link connector, the BS1H has a general remote port connection on it that is compatible with a number of link controllers. So it's very possible that the EVA handle should work if it's just a um, uh, 2.5 millimeter link. But I'm not personally familiar enough with the handle for the EVA, so I, I would have to check. I wouldn't just go plugging in uh, certain adapters um, to make stuff like that work if it's something that's running power. Uh, but LANC is a fairly simple control. It's either going to work or it's not. Um, so I will definitely check with Matt uh, on that uh, great things, and then we'll uh, get back to you. Um, let's see here. Uh, is the GH6 timecode signal line or mic level? I can't find any information on that. Uh, the GH6 timecode is out through the PC sync port. Uh, so it comes out as it's, it's a direct uh, output. It's not running over an audio channel. Um, let's see here. Keith, uh, okay. So that was a reply to that one. Um, well, wow. what is the practical difference between one area and one area plus? Uh, well, so this, <clears throat> this comes more into um, kind of, I'd say, the tolerance that the box holds for you. So if you use one area, one area is going to be very specific. Anything outside of that box, give or take a couple of pixels outside of the box, it will ignore. It won't use any of that information to figure out the autofocus area. Um, this can be really good for things like macro shooting, um, anything where you need to be very, you know, critical on where your focus point sits when you know that you've got some, some area around it that could be shifting your focus. One area plus gives a secondary region where it will use, uh, that area if in the perfect dead center spot that you're selecting, if that doesn't have any um, viable information for focusing. If there's something in that secondary box area, so the bracketed region outside of the, the solid square, um, that's where it will use that information to assist and get that focus point there. Um, in the real world, this comes in handy, at least the way I've always, uh, used it. This comes in handy with things like portraiture and anytime, like I go photograph my dog when he's out playing. The reason for that is that that one um, central box can be great, but if I want to keep it small, it does make it a little bit harder to keep it on target uh, with the way I with the way I shoot. Uh, so going to one area plus gives me a little bit more wiggle room to you know kind of not have to be as precise with my physical tracking of a subject. I can make it a medium box, have that you know kind of little bit nicer outlying area, and it'll end up um, you know kind of giving me the same results I'd get as if I had, uh, you know, really solid keeping that one point on there. Tracking can be beneficial here too, um, to what uh, others were saying. Uh, it's just a matter of which, which one works best for you. Um, I'm not here to ever tell you that my way is better than the others or that, you know, user A's is better than user B's. 
a lot of times you're going to have to play around a little bit and see which system works for you. That's why I dropped that AF guidebook in there. Um, and that also gives you a little bit of an explanation as well as to naming and understanding of what the different AF modes do for you. Uh, let's see here. Keith, any advice for eyeglass wearers like me who really can't manually focus for moving subjects as well as I used to? Um, I think, honestly, it, it, it comes down to a lot of the, the same things that, that I've been saying for some of the other modes. If, as far as manually focusing goes, manually focusing is an art. Um, it's definitely not for everybody, and it can be faster in, in, in very capable hands. Uh, if you're not really experienced with it, it can be a super big headache. Um, totally understand that for a lot of people. Uh, but ultimately, if if you find that you're starting to have some trouble manually focusing and getting yourself, you know, really, you know, comfortable and reliable results with it, that's where I switch over to one area, one area plus. And then I play around with, depending on the subject that I'm shooting, that's where I'll use the different custom set modes to you know, kind of really dial in the AF settings. It, it all just depends on, on how fast your subject is. If you're just, in, in the case that you pointed out, for moving objects, reduce as many variables out of the system as you can. Set it as one area, set the focus box to where you want to have your framing be done, and then at that point, all you have to do is keep, um, keep that box on the subject for you. Um, you learned in manual focus film days. Yeah. So we're, we're used to that. You focus visually on, on the, the, the glass, or you'd use a split prism and then you'd line the images up, stuff like that. Right. Uh, with the digital cameras, it's that kind of just breaking that I can put the point anywhere I want and then just worry about my composition. I am big on move the point where you want the focus to be in your composition and then just focus on that, that area. Keep the subject in that spot where you want. You isolate down the focusing system. I am not a big fan of using overly complicated uh, systems to get my focus done. Um, I think that's why for the vast majority of stuff, like with our Lumix live streams here, um, if I go to my share screen here, you'll see multiples of me now. But this is my, my BS1H setup. So I know in, in the past streams, you know, I had mentioned about how I don't really use uh, autofocus for uh, interview type con uh, conversations usually because usually you set your focus point you know where it's going to be and that's that's it but for a stream like this because I know that I'm going to be moving around a little bit I may be wanting to show something to camera I use one area here because one area means that I know as you can see right here I know where my focus point is I know where if I'm going to take this camera and I want to present it to screen I know where I have to put the camera so that you guys see it, so that when I take it back away, we know that it's it's gonna do what I want it to do. If I use face detection and it jumps back to 225, you're adding extra levels of variability. I usually don't like to work that way. And this is the same principle for everything else. If I'm gonna be out there photographing and I'm used to manually focusing, pick one area, make that for your framing, how you want that image to look, and then uh, go from there. Uh, let's see here. Um, let's see here. JC is one plus cable of coming to the box cameras and the same for city file name. Uh, I'm not sure what the first part of your question is, uh, JC. Um, it, it's either a typo or I'm just completely not, um, understanding it. Um, but the file naming, I have no information as to whether or not the file naming, uh, will come to the box cameras. Um, but as said before, it's definitely something that we're going to bring up. I know Matt and I have had some conversations about stuff like that. So, um, if you can, uh, clarify the first part of your question, I can, uh, see if I can answer it for you. Why not productions? Uh, not related question. Uh, in how many stops do you guys overexpose your midtones on the GH6? Uh, this will be down to a lot of interpretation. Uh, if you're talking photography or if you're talking videography, the best thing I can recommend is if you are going to be uh, shooting and exposing uh, on the GH6, I highly recommend using the Luminant Spot Meter. Luminant Spot Meter allows me to take 
my gray card and I'm going to set it up in the frame here. Allows me to set up my gray card, move it right onto that particular point, look at my exposure and see exactly, um, you know, what, what I have, how my exposure looks compared. Where if I am, um, if I'm not using that and I'm just trying to judge this on, um, you know, kind of my own feelings uh, for that particular look, this is where you can run into some, some challenges. Um, so you can see right now it says that I'm 52% because I'm in uh, um, like 709. So if I bring this down and get this down to about 42, which is roughly where... Why is it doing this? Oh, because I'm in aperture. So uh, if I bring this down to say, uh, try to get this down to about 42%, um, that's where I'm going to be able to say, okay, my exposure is going to be, my midtones are properly exposed, and then I am lighting the rest of my scene uh, to fix the rest of that as I decide to just pull that screen and move it. Sorry, everybody. Um, so there's not really going to be any kind of guarantee to say how many stops over or under you move your midtones. Uh, if you can't light your image, um, I typically suggest exposing the highlights, um, to the highest points you can. Um, that's where you have the ability to, again, use luminance spot meter or waveform, get your highlights about as bright as you can get them, uh, on that range and know that in post you've got enough room to pull those highlights back in frame. Let's see here. Sebastian says, I've noticed on the GH6, the 5.8K open gate is far less stable shooting handheld than other uh, resolutions. Any thought or user error? Um, I haven't experienced any situation of the open gate being any less stable um, from a, an image stabilization uh, perspective. I'm curious what lenses you might be using. Um, if you let me know what lens you're using, uh, I might be able to either replicate or... Uh, give a recommendation um yes you know, to to what may help uh let's see here um can you ask to check also the ssds can be bought in europe fine lexar cf express are almost impossible to find in europe in 512 size uh and are overpriced had to buy in us so yeah that is something else that, that does also get, you know, kind of, they, they, that does come into consideration is, are the devices that we're going to be saying work with this, are they available everywhere or as in as many places as possible? Um, I believe SanDisk and uh, the, uh, uh, some of those new Samsung drives, I think they're fairly well available uh, or fairly easily available in almost every region, at least, uh, through retailers or through online, uh, e-tailers. Uh, but yeah, some of that stuff does come into consideration. Uh, it is something that we do look at when it comes to CF express cards. Uh, that did come down to what were the most reliable ones that we could test with, uh, and basically validate that these work and would be ready for the time that we launched the camera. So yeah, that's what the Lexar cards are. There are others available, um, that are on that list. Some SanDisk, um, I think, uh, yeah, the SanDisk, Panasonic and Lexar cards, I think have all made the list for approval. So if you take a look at the site, we can definitely, um, take a look. It does get updated. I don't know if it's been updated recently, but as we validate more cards, they, they do get updated. So, um, let's see here. Uh, one plus area. Oh, Okay. All right, I, now I'm following JC. So to see if one plus area can come to the uh, box cameras. Um, I will check uh, and see if that's something that was planned to come to the box cameras. I don't know if it will, uh, but we'll ask. Um, let's see here. CF Express to M.2 adapter is working as long as GH runs on batteries or gets proper. Yeah, so one thing that I, that I have to... Definitely make sure I mention here, um, we do not condone M.2 SSD adapters uh, into the CF Express card. You are introducing a possible uh, point of failure. Uh, so from our side, we do not recommend that at all. 
Um, using media that is supposed to be going into the slot and not adapting is, uh, from our perspective, that's the only thing that we can condone is using the proper media. Uh, if you adapt things and it happens to break your camera, that's usually not something that we would cover. So, um, it's, it's your equipment. Um, but just know about, you know, the whole thing with warranties and stuff like that. So, uh, let's see here. Uh, Jake Keel, uh, are the S pro lenses capable of both mechanical and software manual, manual focus? Is this still software based, even though the clutch option, uh, so that's a good question. The manual focus on the S pro lenses or any lens that has a clutch is still software to a point. Um, by pulling that back, you're switching into a linear, uh, a linear track that it's reading. So it combines with the camera, it knows the positioning information, and that's how it, it does the manually focusing. It's not a mechanical couple to the actual elements uh, like older style lenses. Um, let's see here. Face priority and multimetering description. When it's set to multimetering, the camera measures brightness based on detected faces. Is there any dependency, uh, is there any dependency AF mode used? Uh, so Martin, if you're using the face priority and multimetering, um, if you have the, uh, subject detection turned on with face and eye or a face is detected, face and eye is detected, uh, that's when that system, uh, can enable. And, and that is something to be aware of, um, that you can, uh, you know, as you're looking through these things, if you go in and, um, I even forget exactly where it is, um, but on the GH6, it is something that you you probably do want to be aware of if you have turned on uh, at some point, uh, because that that can throw off your metering if you're not um, thinking about it. So what we're talking about is face priority multimetering. Um, it it solely just means you have to have the box on the face. Um, so if you're in any of the other modes and you have a box on the face, it's going to adjust the multimetering for that that particular point. Uh, let's see here. Uh, can we use FN buttons to cycle between zebra one, two, uh, and off as in the GH five, the GH six seems to force us to map zebras to their own FN button. So if I come in here, uh, I just went to program my bottom, uh, FN button on the back here. Uh, now I gotta remember where zebras are. <clears throat> it shows you how often I have to come in here and change these things. So zebra pattern. So if I go in here and I select say zebra one and I push down, it's zebra one, push down again, it's zebra off. So yeah, you have those, but if you come into the menu and do, I think it's okay. So yeah, you would have to, uh, define each one in their own spot. Uh, some of that comes from the, the feedback of, you know, if you're having to press it multiple times, you miss it, the one go around, then you got to click it three more times. Some of it comes down to efficiencies. Um, but yeah, so the current way that it works is that each one of the FN buttons would be programmed to which uh, Zebra system you want to use. Uh, let's see here. Martin says, I really like the idea of using the AF system to set exposure uh, while keeping focus set to manual. We need to set the box and following a person's face, etc. cetera. Um, well, so... The multimetering is not is not necessarily going to set your exposure, um, if I'm understanding what you're asking cor correctly. Um, use an AF system to set exposure while keeping focus set to manual. We need to see the box and follow. The so it, in a case like that, if you're in manual focus, the face priority stuff won't work because those are tied to the autofocus systems. Um, that would be something cool to see, uh, in the future, but, um, that would be down the line as a, a feature that would have to be evaluated if it's, if it's, um, possible to couple while in manual focus. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Lumix, uh, or great things would be great to make the rear tally lamp blink twice when opening the box camera. Uh, hard to confirm the camera turned on when operating from behind. Uh, that is a good point. Um, I can definitely bring that over to the team. Um, we don't comment on rumors, uh, and 
Rumors are rumors. They're usually made up by people who have nothing better to do than to try to stoke fires uh, within the industry um, and try to make up their own wants and desires within cameras is about all I'll say about that one. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Any future firmware update for the S1? Uh, nothing that I can uh, confirm or deny. Um, if you have uh, requests, like a lot of people have been asking in through here, definitely drop them in the chat uh, and it goes to our team. And if they can do some stuff, they'll do some stuff. Uh, let's see here. Sebastian, okay, so you're using a 12 to 60 and the PL100 to 400, all updated lenses, uh, as is your GH6. So let me go back to your other question here. Um, okay, so I will check with my 12 to 60 and 100 to 400 to see if I see anything different um, as far as stabilization goes. I, I honestly, like I said, I haven't noticed any kind of stabilization difference with those, um, but I also haven't had to, haven't really been looking for it. The footage I've shot in open gate has been perfectly stable for what I need. Um, I can dig deeper into it. Uh, and then, uh, we'll try to update you sometime next week. Uh, Sebastian, um, let's see here. Uh, let's see. I've got, Oh, I've got time for one more question. Uh, I have experience with M.2 adapters and SSD drives. It corrupts files randomly, uh, makes it impossible to play your footage and freezes the camera if you try. Um, yes, that is one of the reasons why we do not recommend using the adapters for, uh, the, you know, any kind of media. You never want to, you never want to run anything that's, that's critical for making sure your footage stays reliable that needs to have supplemental power or things like that. At that point, it's much easier to just get an external recorder and plug in an SSD that way and record. It's way more reliable. It's industry tested. Um, it, it's just better. Um, if you're looking at something where you're going between, like I can see here, two amps to two and a half amps, you know, the, the, this is this is that stuff as to why we don't ever recommend doing that stuff. It is just, it's just not a good thing to do, especially if you're in a professional work environment you're adding a layer of uncertainty to your product that you're selling to somebody. And if the camera fails at that point because voltage drops or something, that's not the camera's fault. That's the adapter's fault and the things that you're doing with uh, adding in media in ways that it was never designed for. So yeah, that's the last I'm gonna say on that. Um, I, can only, uh, I can only point to the things that I know we provide for the cameras that that are designed to work the way they're supposed to um cool all right uh so uh let's see here uh well, actually i can take one last question what time are we at 208 i can take one last question and then i can move on um carlos says what are the best settings to keep af locked on the face and in focus there have been times where the box is on the face but it's out of focus i uh, so depending on the environment that you're in uh, like what I'm doing here for the Lumix Live stuff, I use one area. I do not use face detection uh, in, in my cameras, um, at least for the Lumix Live stuff. The reason being is that I, I use this because I want to be able to tell the camera exactly where it needs to go if it loses a face. Um, I find that this just tends to be the most reliable because like I showed before, I can come up, I can put my camera, I can cover my face, I can, you know, do a demonstration, I can pull it back, and I'm in focus, and I didn't have to, to touch anything for it, so, yeah, um, let's see here, yeah, I think that pretty much covers about the most we can, um, so like we said, uh, the DFD and the focusing stuff, it, it is such an involved way of, uh, it's, it's such an involved conversation because of all the vastly different, uh, areas that people use focusing for. We had a lot of users that were talking about wildlife photography and bird photography or bird in flight. Uh, and that's definitely one segment with it. Um, but then you have portrait photography and a wedding and event photography or uh, studio scenarios like what I have here. All of these things are going to be different, um, handled differently between each individual user. Uh, and my idea moving forward is I want to be able to break down each of these different kinds of areas as we move through the summer um, to give each of these areas kind of the their 
their time to actually be, you know, kind of discussed. Uh, so if, if, if y'all liked this kind of conversation where we, I know this was a bit more of a brief overview and we're heavy on the viewer questions, but if you want to have a conversation and a stream that's much more about specifically one type of, uh, style of photography and videography and do them as a series, let me know in the comments of this video afterwards, not in the chat. Let me know in the comments after, um, Putting them in the comments allows me to just much more easily go back and review them um, since the chat is based on when you actually type them in. Uh, so yes, if you do that, um, we'll be able to plan some some different uh, content moving forward, maybe get some uh, other ambassadors and uh, other experts within to kind of help bring some more of that information out to all of y'all. Uh, so yeah, with that... Um, I want to remind everybody, Lumix Pro Services, we talked about it before. Uh, we've got the red tier and the platinum tier here in the United States. Red is free. Uh, if you own a Lumix camera and you bought it through an authorized dealer, definitely go take a look. Get yourself registered for free. Uh, if you want the next level up, go take a look at the uh, Lumix Pro Series or Lumix Pro Services Platinum. Uh, that tier is paid. Uh, you do get uh, a lot of extra benefits, uh, as you can see on the screen there. So definitely go take a look at those uh, sites there. If you're joining us from overseas, take a look at the link down in the description. We've got uh, links to the global portal for the um, pro services there. Um, if you don't already, follow us over on Instagram. Uh, we've got plenty of um, uh, plenty of conversation and cool stuff going on over on the Instagram page. Uh, if you want to uh, continue interacting with us, you can do that over on the Instagram page. Uh, you can follow me over on Reddit. Uh, I'm Sean at Lumix. I try to jump into some of the different uh, subreddits on and off. Uh, and then, yeah, uh, we'll be back here uh, next Thursday, 2 p.m. Eastern time uh, with another stream. So, yeah, uh, if, if you enjoyed this video and you feel that, that we've uh, earned a like or a subscription from you, hit the like button, subscribe. It w means a ton to me. It helps me, you know, generate more of this content and you know, really keep this thing going. Uh, yeah. So with that, everybody, thank you all. I'll talk to you next Thursday, 2 p.m. Eastern time, and I hope you all have a great rest of your weekend. Later.